Even the most frenzied fans out there are bound to have missed a few hidden details along the way. Here are some of the things you still might have missed after even your umpteenth binge session of Friends. Throughout Friends' 10 seasons, there were a lot of famous faces to grace the place, from Brad Pitt and his I Hate Rachel Club, to Julia Roberts stealing Chandler's underpants, to Bruce Willis going from protective dad mode to a crying baby who's still not over his cruel chicken boy nickname from childhood. Danny DeVito, Hank Azaria, George Clooney, and Christina Applegate are also among the show's many celebrated guest stars. And how about some Reese Witherspoon? Phoebe, and that's Joey. Hey, how you doing? Don't you! <laughs> Family members and showbiz were also welcome to join the Friends fun. In addition to Pitt and Courtney Cox's eventual husband David Arquette, Matthew Perry's father John Bennett Perry made a brief cameo in Season 4. Then in Season 7, actress Alexis Arquette, who was also Courtney Cox's former sister-in-law, briefly appeared in a scene starring herself and Perry. Meanwhile, the VIP guest stars that might have gone unnoticed were the series' creatives, Marta Kaufman, Kevin Bright, and David Crane, who made several appearances throughout the show. They were seen as the audience to Joey's Holden McGroin audition snafu in the first season, then again on the set of the Hollywood Outbreak movie starring Ross's Monkey. Some of the executive producers also stole the group's prime chill spot at Central Perk in the season 3 premiere episode. And execs were also seen on the double-decker bus Joey and Chandler rode in London for season 4. The magnetic board at Joey and Chandler's apartment didn't arrive until the third season, but it became a secret VIP of the show with its random displays of amateur artistry. Sometimes it had utilitarian purposes, like taking phone messages or making a grocery list, but it also proved to be a great source of subtle jokes and outright immaturity. So, pretty much the norm for these fellas. Well, I see you've had a very productive day. <laughs> Don't you think the cowboy hat's a little much? Come on, it's fun! <laughs> All right. If you've ever had ambitions of visiting Central Perk and ordering a scone just to beat it down like Ross did, or go full throttle on the espressos during a particularly bad breakup, oh my god do we have news for you! Turns out, the menu at our favorite coffee house was actually filled with clever and alliterative options that our friends never even tried out on the show, like Long Island Cream, a movingly rich and creamy coffee straight from the mutter's udder, and… Fifth Avenue, going shopping? You'll need some fuel. Try this trendy blend while you spend. Who knew Gunther had so many puns tucked away in that bleach blonde brain of his? Delicious. Considering none of them owned the place, that we knew of at least, it did seem a little strange how the coolest couch in the coffee house was almost always free and available to the group at any given time. Well, thanks to some eagle-eyed viewers, the mystery has been solved. In some of the earliest episodes, there's a small, reserved sign perched right there on the coffee table. And while it might not have been the most obvious signage, it did seem to keep the big orange couch clear for the crew more often than not. In Friends' first season, Monica's apartment door bore the number 5, with Chandler and Joey's numbered 4, but their addresses were later changed to apartments 19 and 20. You all knew and you didn't tell me?" The producers reportedly wanted to make it clear that the gang lived on the second floor of the building, a fact which would come in handy for many, many balcony scenes to come. That wasn't the only major mix-up at Monica's, though. There was also the matter of the annoying support beam which conveniently disappeared from sight. And let's not forget the way her window view never seemed the same. It was all pretty disorienting and hard to overlook. I relied on a carefully regimented program of denial, and, and wetting the bed. By now, it's probably no secret that the New York set of Friends was actually just an L.A. soundstage at Warner Brothers. But one place that did serve as an authentic location for episodes abroad was London. Everyone except actress Lisa Kudrow, who, like her character Phoebe, was actually unable to travel during pregnancy at that time, was England-bound for those episodes. But after the difficult experience of taking the show quite literally on the road, the producers vowed to never do so again. So, the group's later trips, like their fateful venture out to Vegas and Chandler's job jump to Oklahoma, were all filmed in the comforts of their studio home. By the way, the house that Chandler and Monica bought in Brooklyn? Turns out that the scenery you can see through the windows was actually reused background stock footage from Home Alone. Most people probably caught the addition of the Arquette name to every single person on the credits in celebration of Courtney Cox's then-marriage to former guest star David Arquette. But one name-wink that might have slipped through the cracks happened around another wedding celebration on the show. 
When Rachel was in search of a substitute officiant to fill in for Joey at Monica and Chandler's wedding, she came upon a Greek Orthodox wedding of someone who happened to bear the original name of Jennifer Aniston. Anastasakis, Papasifakis wedding, excellent! <laughs> Considering how often Ross, the divorce force, managed to get hitched and unhitched, it's no surprise that there were a lot of wedding gowns that came into play along the way. And while fans might have noticed that the wedding dress Monica was supposed to pick up in store for Emily looked nothing like the one she actually wore, or that Phoebe never wore Monica's veil as her something borrowed, what hasn't gotten much attention is the fact that Rachel's original wedding dress from her altar ditch with Barry was the same one that she wore for fun the day of her breakup with Joshua. Who says you can't wear those things twice? It'd sure save Dr. Geller some cash. Hey! She's right, you know. <laughs> yeah, but still, cheap shot. Oh, Joey. He's such a lovable oaf. His innocence is endearing, and it makes for a lot of hilarious moments. Remember the time he thought his Adam's apple was called a Joey's apple? Would you put that back on? Monica's gonna be here any minute. But it hurts my Joey's apple. <laughs> Or the time he thought there were 56 states? It kind of makes you wonder how Joey manages to remember all his lines for his acting jobs. The guy can't even remember his own pin number. When he's in Las Vegas for an acting gig that falls through, he has to ask Phoebe to go to the ATM near his apartment and look for his pin number, which he had scratched into the machine. Listen, uh, can you do me a favor? I got the pin number to my ATM card. Can you get it for me? Sure, where is it? Uh, I scratched it on the ATM machine down on the corner. The pin number, 5639, holds special significance for Joey, which makes it even funnier that he can't remember it. When you punch the numbers into a phone, the digits actually spell out Joey. All Joey has to do to type in his pin number is literally spell his name, and he can't even remember that! Depending on who you ask, the on-again, off-again relationship between Ross and Rachel is either one of the show's best qualities or its most obnoxious. Whether or not you believe the two were on a break, you probably didn't notice that Rachel's pregnancy goes on for a really, really long time. Like, an impossibly long time. Rachel and Ross briefly rekindle their romance before Monica and Chandler get married, and things get pretty hot and heavy. Did you do it on our invitations? <laughs> Not on the ones we sent out. This is the part where we need to do some math. Even assuming that Rachel is only a couple weeks pregnant when she takes the pregnancy test, she's seemingly pregnant for almost a whole year. We know that Monica's wedding date is May 15th, which means Rachel was pregnant by early May at the latest. You'd think that by the time Valentine's Day rolled around nine months later, she'd be ready to give birth. But Ross mentions that the baby recently started kicking, something that usually happens much earlier in a pregnancy. Rachel doesn't give birth until the season finale, which, judging by the lightweight clothes everyone is wearing, takes place in the spring. That's one long pregnancy. The quirky, deadpan barista Gunther may not be a main character, but he brings a whole lot of laughs whenever he pops up on screen. Hey, so what is this, some kind of snake or something? Fun fact, James Michael Tyler, the actor who played Gunther, was a real-life barista when he was hired to be an extra on Friends to help Central Perk look more authentic by pretending to work the espresso machine. Tyler had been an extra on the show for a while, without any lines, of course, when one of the creators, Marta Kaufman, asked if he had any acting experience. In 2014, Tyler recounted the experience to BuzzFeed, explaining, I said, yeah, I have a Master of Fine Arts in acting, actually. I've done a lot of stage, theater stuff, and things like that. And she said, that's really good to know. And then... About midway through the second season, they said, your name is Gunther. And you're an hour character, and you have a line in their show, and it is, yeah. That one line turned out to be the start of bigger things to come, and Gunther ended up becoming a memorable part of the series. Hey, Gunther, be a good little boy, bring me a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Estelle Leonard, Joey's talent agent, might not be a huge character on Friends, but she is certainly unforgettable. Have you ever seen me ecstatic? No. Oh. Well, here it is. <laughs> While we love her, we can't help but blame her for the rough state of Joey's acting career. She isn't exactly the most professional of agents, and you can't help but wonder just how successful Joey could have been with an agent who actually cared. I'm gonna tell you the same thing I told Al Minza and his pyramid of dogs. <laughs> 
Take any job you can get and don't make on the floor. Even Phoebe, who has no experience in the industry, does a better job getting Joey acting gigs when she briefly acts as his agent. If you look closely, there's actually a reason Estelle is such a lousy agent. She's working two jobs, or at least the actress who played her is. June Gable, the actress who played Estelle, appears in a season one episode as a nurse in the hospital where Ross's son Ben is born. All right, honey, time to start pushing. It's hard to forget Frank Buffet Jr., Phoebe's half-brother. Phoebe grew up not knowing about her little brother as her dad abandoned her family. Hey, lady. Hey, wait up. How do you know my dad? Once the two finally meet, in Season 2, Episode 21, Frank is close to graduating from high school. The two get off to an awkward start, but eventually develop an affectionate sibling relationship. After Frank graduates from high school, he marries his former teacher. Phoebe acts as a surrogate for the couple, giving birth to triplets in the show's 100th episode. I want to do this. I want to carry your baby. Oh. 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 Thank you so much. Even if you're the most dedicated fan, you probably didn't realize that you actually saw Giovanni Ribisi, the actor who played Frank, in an earlier episode. Ribisi appears in Season 2, Episode 6, as the guy who accidentally drops a condom in Phoebe's guitar case when she's performing on the sidewalk outside of Central Perk. Uh, did I accidentally drop a condom in your case? <laughs> it's kind of an emergency. Alas, the condom guy was not actually intended to be Phoebe's brother. Rabisi was initially supposed to be an extra on the show, but the producers liked him so much that they decided to write him into the supporting cast. Now that's what we call being in the right place at the right time.